everyone uh, uh, for coming uh, to the uh, IDSS uh, seminar. It's a pleasure to have here among us today uh, Professor Bernard Chazel from uh, Princeton, Computer Science Department uh, at uh, Princeton. Uh, Bernard uh, has, is very well known for a lot of things and uh, I guess the, 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 the best known algorithm is the soft heap data structure algorithm but he's also done, uh, actually myself, I've known him through this uh, tree spanning and, uh, and uh, also the, uh, the computational geometry uh, problems that he's worked on. He's been uh, very prolific and very productive and uh, he's uh, he went to Ecole des Mines in uh, Paris, which is one of the sort of distinguished uh, Ecole, uh, the Grandes Ecoles, as they call them in France, and uh, did his graduate uh, uh, school at Yale University, where he got his PhD in computer science. He held uh, uh, very prominent positions in various institutions, Carnegie Mellon, Brown, NEC, etc. He's a fe uh, fellow of Guggenheim, of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, NEC as well as the European Academy of Sciences. Uh, Bernard doesn't shy away from, uh, doesn't sh easily shy away from many uh, things uh, and in particular some controversial things. He's been also writing some political uh, uh, essays and I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, <laughs> but he's not, he's, he's not, afra he's not afraid of uh, taking on, uh, taking on uh, controversial topics. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. And uh, today he'll share some of his insights uh, on uh, uh, data-powered algorithms. And uh, it's very interesting, these high-dimensional uh, data analysis with all their uh, difficulties and complexities. Uh, look forward to hearing it. And thank you for coming. And welcome. Well, <coughs> thank you very much, Hamid. I'd love to be here. Thank you for being such a gracious host. and. Um, you can hear me? It's, it's fine? Okay, so I will st start with something hopefully controversial, which is that uh, uh, science is changing. And the 20th century of sciences was mostly sciences of, of the formula. And uh, mathematics is really the triumph of science in the 20th century is the fact that so much could be modeled by simple differential equations. And uh, physics, chemistry, astronomy, all these revolutions of the 20th century are really owed, first and foremost, in my view, to the power of the expressive power of mathematics. And uh, you can fill just one page worth of equations, whether Maxwell or others, and uh, that'll be enough to describe most of the physical phenomena around you, which is quite astonishing. And the hope is that we could reproduce this magic with the new sciences, uh, genomics, neuroscience, I call these network economics, uh, but you know what I mean, st studying complex structures in way of networks and things like that, which you also see in the biological world. And then I believe that the, the classical take on it through PDEs, through mathematics, uh, is going to fail. That there's not going to be magical equations like Maxwell's equations, which will allow you to, to do that. And I'm not sure I know what the answer will be to this, if there's one, but I think that the algorithm has, stands a good chance of dethroning, replacing, uh, or at least working side by side with, with our old friend, the mathematical formula. And uh, so let me just explain this a little bit in the context of my own research. Uh, so I work in algorithms, uh, really, and uh, <coughs> the most astonishing development in the last, am I making this noise or? Is that the bomb is about to explode or something? <laughs> <laughs> now I better hurry up. Um, which is really the explosion of data, okay? That, uh, and it's not just quantitative. There's a qualitative way to this thing, the way you know, things have changed, which makes us reflect as algorithm designers, approach our, our task rather differently. For one thing, as Hamid was saying, the data has become very large, very big. Uh, it has low entropy, I'll get to that later. Uh, often it's uncertain, the levels of uh, uncertainty, and it's not uniformly priced. You can get the same data with more or less accuracy depending on how much you pay. And in, say, biology, this involves different experiments, and so the, the differences are huge. Uh, 
and uh, it's very often very high dimensional. I mean, very very high dimensional. Uh, it's noisy. It's uh, often it comes in a streaming way, like video, like what I'm doing right now. So today I'd like to talk, depending on how well I'm doing time-wise, on a couple of these things, or maybe two or three or four, uh, starting with low entropy. Okay, so this <coughs> leads me to this topic of self-improving algorithm works that I've been doing with some students, former students, uh, Nier Alon and Ding Liu, and current students, Seshadri uh, Komandur. Um, and the idea is this. Uh, the way I was taught algorithms, you know, there's the input space, and then there's the computer where you, you do things, you solve some problems. Now, there are really two schools of thought. There's the worst case school of thought, and then there's the average case. Now, I, I would say by and large, the worst case in some ways has triumphed in, that, in the sense that people doing algorithm design, statistically, there are just more people, I think, uh, worrying about worst case situations than than average case. Now, the worst case situation, if you will, is this. <laughs> Any decision you make will have the worst possible outcome, no matter what. So that's one view of the world. And the other one, which is more sober, maybe, more re realistic, is to say that, no, no, you shouldn't really worry about things, except for some tasks which are like mission critical, you know, like planes exploding, you don't want this to happen. But if it's for many algorithmic tasks, it's okay if the time is or performance is good on average. But the problem there is that the math tends to be very difficult. And often you'll have to make some assumptions that say the distribution is uniform. Sometimes you can justify why that's true. Sometimes you cannot, even though you'll try very hard. And the truth is that uh, it's hard enough. The math is hard enough when it's uniform. If it's not uniform, then it's completely hopeless. Um, so. The hope was to replace all this. So again, the worst case thing is the paranoid view of, of the world that, that, that the worst thing is, you know, that can possibly happen uh, will happen. <laughs> the average case, here's the problem. And actually that motivation for this work came in work I did in computer graphics, uh, actually about 3D things like the sort of thing Hamid uh, works on. And, uh, and we're trying to come up with a distribution o o on the input. A and then we just give up because whatever we come up with, you know, Gaussian or uh, mixture and so on, it just failed to capture what was happening. So just throw up our hands and say, well, let's not do that. Instead, let's do the following. Let's simply assume that there is a distribution out there which is time invariant. But it's completely arbitrary. We don't know what it is. And it's unknown. We don't have a clue what it is. But the interesting thing is that it occupies a thin slice of input space. It doesn't fill the entire thing, okay? Otherwise, it's just uniform distribution. And that's the notion of self-improving algorithm. So for those of you who know machine learning, machine learning is a descriptive approach to this problem. This slice, this input slice, a machine learning person wants to understand, wants to be able to describe, wants to be able to sample it, wants to be able to predict navigation on, on that slice. That's what machine learning is, is descriptive. And what I want to say is, let's do this but in, in a prescriptive way. Let's do this not in order to understand the slice, but let's do it in order to perform a specific task better. The analogy I, I have is, you know, you can study math or geography for the beauty of the thing, but if you're in high school, you might do it for the SAT or for the test. These are rather different things. So what I'm going to advocate here is that let's think of doing it for the SAT, for the test, not learning this distribution for its own sake, okay? Just with one specific, and any shortcut we can take, we'll take it. That's the idea, okay? So, so here's the, the thing. So suppose I've solved all these problems, and now I have my company, and I sell software, and I'm very rich, and, uh, and now you buy my software, and here's what happens. You install it the first day. Of course, it works fine, and, but it's slow because it doesn't know anything about you, so uh, you just bought it off the shelf. So it runs a worst case or average case or whatever it runs is the vanilla generic algorithm, and then you run it once, and then the next day you run it again so on a different input from the distribution, which is unknown. Then it goes a little faster, then the next day, 
gets a little faster still. And then the next day, it's even faster. Now what's happening is the algorithm is learning about you. It's learning about you, the client, with your distribution. It's learning enough that it will converge eventually toward an optimal expected time uh, for a random source. Okay, that's, that's the holy grail. Okay, and by and large we cannot accomplish this. Now, before we go to specific algorithms, let's outline um, a paradigm, a, a template of algorithm. That is not the most general, but it's very intuitive. I assume that's the way you in the audience would probably come up with if you, you know, had five minutes to think about it. You'd go like this. Well, there'd be a training phase where my algorithm, my software is going to learn about you the way you use things. Okay? It's going to be biased. Like Google is going to cache your, your, uh, your, your pictures and sites thinking maybe you're going to use them again, so they'll be there cached. So see, Google is doing that sort of thing already, but we won't be a bit fancier than that. So there's input space, okay, and th there's some distribution on that, which you don't know uh, over that. Now there are the typical inputs and the non-typical. And the first thing you want to be able to do is to classify. Here's this input is typical and this one is not. Now, once you can do this, here's what happens. You start playing, so you start using this as a client. And this is the first input, and it's viewed as typical. And then another one is typical. Another one is typical. And most of them are going to be typical by definition. Another one is typical. Oh, and then one that comes that's not typical. OK, it's atypical. Then there's another one that's atypical. And so now the training phase is over. Here's what you do. You remove the atypical ones. You look at the typical inputs, which you have solved using the standard method. Okay, And then you're going to do something. You're going to build this data structure in the following way. So now you enter the steady state phase. And instead of telling you how you build the data structure, I'm going to tell you how the algorithm from now on is going to operate. And from that, you'll be able to understand what kind of data structure you need for this. So suppose you've built this uh, steady state algorithm. The algorithm has converged to its final configuration. It'll never change again. Now, if there's an input that's not typical, then intuition says, why don't you we use just the, the standard algorithm. It's not typical anyway. It's not going to happen too often. So just use the standard algorithm, which you had er, you know, earlier. If it is typical, then here's what you do. You say, well, maybe I, if, if, if I'm lucky, the Google thing, if I'm lucky, this typical I've already pre-computed. I'm just going to look it up. Okay. But if you're not lucky, here's what you do. You define some kind of distance measure. And you have an approximate nearest neighbor data structure, which will allow you to find somebody that is maybe not the nearest, but now you've spotted this thing. Now the reason why you don't go for the nearest but approximate nearest is because you'll see most often the way the distance is defined, the actual nearest would be too hard to compute. It, it, it might require uh, exponential time. I mean, uh, not exponential time, but it might require just too much. So you want to do it very fast. So you'll do just approximate. So it's this guy here. And here's what you do. You'll start from there, and then incrementally you will... So this is a solution, and you will change the solution to what you want. Think about it, for example, suppose you're solving a... Uh, kind of a uh, linear programming problem. And perhaps you've solved something that's slightly perturbed, that's a little different, and it gives you the optimal solution. Now, if you start from an optimal solution and you know where you are in that convex polytope, the feasibility polytope, then chances are you're not too far from the new optimal solution. So, you know, in linear programming, you know that if you know how to start well, then you're going to do very well. And so that's what you would do. And, but every algorithm is going to have its own different way of doing this sort of incremental. Uh, in many ways, I think that's how many people learn, learn things. Very, like children very often will, you know, they see a bunch of animals, then they see another one at the zoo. And they don't have like sort of, sort of like empty slate where they say, okay, this is an animal, it's got four legs, it's got... They immediately think, you know, is that a sheep? Is that a horse? It's kind of a horse and a sheep, you know? That's the sort of thing that they do. 
Uh, the way I present it, it's binary. There's training and then there's steady phase. But actually, the algorithm we present are evolve continuously. They, they, they actually improve every time a little bit. But it's easier analytically to think about it this way. So I'll give you two examples. Um, one is a sorting. Now, we, we started with sorting because, um, well, you have to start with, some, with something. And um, sorting is not the most interesting problem in the world. In many ways, it's a completely solved problem. But it's a simple problem. It's a problem on which, for which we know a lot. There's so many different ways of doing it. So let's start with something simple, even if not terribly useful, and uh, where we know a lot before getting to the more complicated stuff. Okay? So, so you're given an input drawn from a distribution that is unknown, again, and you want to sort it. So our result is the following. that. Um, there will be a limited complexity, so that's the complexity of the steady state algorithm, that will be proportional to the input size n, plus the entropy of the distribution. Okay, there's this little sign, which means that it's not quite the entropy of the distribution. It's the entropy of the permutation, okay, induced by d, which can be only smaller. It could be much smaller, but it could be, it, it cannot be bigger, obviously. And Okay, the storage is huge. Uh, when you make no assumption whatsoever about the distribution D, this is the best we can do, and strangely enough, it's optimal. Uh, the time is optimal. In a comparison-based model, you'll never beat this complexity anyway. And the, the strange thing is that this completely unrealistic storage is actually optimal also for arbitrary distributions, okay? Now, so that's not terribly interesting. I mean, who wants to do this? This is exponential. So, what if the each x i is drawn independently? Think of drawing like darts on a board or something like that. Can you do better than that? The answer is yes. We can achieve the same limiting complexity, and storage now is only n squared. Okay, so it's much better. Actually, you can do better than that. For any epsilon, uh, constant or not, you can achieve this limiting complexity and storage n to the 1 plus epsilon. So you see the storage is not linear. And you can ask yourself, well, does it have to be that way? And the answer is yes, that the storage cannot be linear. And that came a bit as a surprise. I mean, when we thought, you never sort with more than linear storage. So why should you? Um, um, that actually storage, when you learn, evidently, nonlinear storage is really going to make a difference. If you constrain yourself to just a linear amount of storage in your head, you cannot do better than n log n. I mean, I mean you can always run quick sort. Um, so that came as a bit of a surprise. The second thing that we wanted to know is how much do you have to learn? This studying for the, for the test. The idea of studying for the test is that you don't have to work as hard, presumably. That's why people don't like it. I mean, teachers don't like it. Students love it. But, um, and here it really is the case that, in fact, you have to learn very little about the distribution, surprisingly little about the distribution. Pretty much you're going to have to be able to estimate its entropy, and that's pretty much it. But you can do this very fast, and uh, so much less work than a typical machine learning approach to learning distributions. Number of training rounds is this. Uh, okay, maybe a more timely or interesting problem, clustering. Uh, okay, sorting is pretty much the only problem where we have tight answers. So it's a kind of a solved problem. Uh, everything else, uh, it's far from being optimal. So here's an example. You have n points in the Hamming cube, OK? So these are n bit vectors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the two median question is the following. You want to partition this into two subsets. And for each one, you find a center, which is not necessarily one of the n points. It's just some points in the Hamming cube. And then you connect everybody to their nearest neighbor. And you add up these distances. And you want to minimize that. Now that is as well known as NP-hard. All these variants of problems are NP-hard. And um, so you look, at you look for approximation algorithms. Okay? And Kumar, Sabaral, and Sen have the, uh, which, uh, what I believe is currently the, the best one. It's a very nice algorithm which provides an optimal solution up to a relative error of epsilon in time that is linear in the input size, d times n, and 
uh, is exponential in epsilon. I mean, it, it has to be exponential. Otherwise, you've proven p is not equal to np. And uh, so that's a very nice complexity, uh, well, except for small epsilon. This is huge, OK? I mean, if you want like 1% error, just imagine how big this is going to be. And the constant, by the way, is very bad. It's not like the constant is you know, Planck's constant or something. It's, uh, so what we do is uh, we'd like to achieve linear limiting time. How much do we need to do? Um, so again, we typical, atypical, we try to classify you know, those clustering problems that come to us. And we try to see whether they are typical or not. Okay. By the way, we it's very different from self-adjusting data structures or adaptive data structures, which usually try to find structure within a given input. For example, a, uh, a sorting algorithm might see whether there are a few inversions, and, and then optimize it. We don't try that at all. We never look at the structure of a given input. We only look at the distribution. Okay. It's a very different thing. Um, so the same lower bounds don't apply, OK? Uh, for example, no, any algorithm, I mean, no algorithm can sort better than n log n on average, OK, for any reasonable distribution, adaptive or not. But here, if the distribution can have very low entropy and have a random permutation, I mean, I can start with random permutations, build a distribution on permutations over that, and my algorithm will be linear. Okay, we're running linear time. So it's a completely different model of computation. So what you'll do is you'll collect some data in the training phase, quite a lot actually, and then you compute a center, a magical center, which will provide uh, pretty much the right choice of centers for all the typical inputs. And for the others, you'll run the Kumar et al. algorithm. Very, very simple way of going about it. And so, We've done this for, for other problems, um, graph algorithms, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but the message I want to give is, is that it's a wide open. It's really a wide. I mean, we've only scratched the top of the, you know, the tip of the iceberg, and uh, you would never scratch the tip of an iceberg, well, unless you just thrown off the Titanic and you're just trying to get on top of that iceberg. But uh, whatever the expression. Uh, so let me just switch gears. I mean, this is going to be a, a talk with a just jump from, uh, again, going back to that bubble with data in big letters and then all these different problems that come from, uh, from that. So that was low entropy uh, in the sense that self-improving really tries to exploit the fact that the actual input world is much smaller than it looks simply by counting the bits. Okay, uh, Online data... Reconstruction is also a take on coding theory, and which again really comes, it's not like I woke up one morning and just thought, oh, that'd be cool to work on this. The genesis of these things usually are actually specific problems we worked on and we figure, but that's really what, what we need. And, uh, and then we try to make something more general out of it. So here's the deal. When you have data and you have noise, the typical approach from the 50s is to do the following, is to say, well, OK, if you're going to have noise, what you do is you take the clean uh, data, and then you encode it in a redundant fashion. Then there's noise that comes. Ah, but you've encoded it. So there's enough redundancy built in that with high probability, you're always, you can decode it. OK, that's the standard thing. Now, this works wonders. This is beautiful. The only problem is that you have to know what the clean data is. But very often, in particular in my field of uh, geometry, uh, the data comes to you. It's not clean. You know it's not clean, but you don't know what clean data is. Okay? So you have to make some assumptions if the data is inaccessible before the noise. I mean, what makes you think that it's wrong? If I speak, um, if I speak Berber to you, and I make grammatical mistakes, so not Hamid. But you're in no position to tell me that I'm making mistakes, because even though I might be making mistakes, because presumably you don't understand a word of what I'm saying. Now, he knows. So of course, he will be able to say that I'm making mistakes. But my point is that it's, it's bizarre to say this data is, is all dirty when you don't have a clue what the clean data might be like. Okay? So 
The assumption that you might want to make is that the data, and in geometry, that's how it, it came about, the data clean means, say, it's convex. It's topologically consistent. There's some properties which you have to assume, and you want to assume them so your algorithm does not crash. I mean, algorithms, programs love to crash, especially in geometry. It's very crash prone. But certainly, if your algorithm assumes points are in convex position, and if they're not, then the bad things are very likely to happen. Now, wouldn't it be nice if your algorithm had a little filter which ensures that whatever is thrown into the algorithm is something that is safe, okay, that, that is convex? Okay, so that's the model that we want to build whereby there's this access function. So there's this function f of x. So think of it, there's a database, and there's a, a function or a, 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 a bunch of methods and object, you know, in object-oriented languages. I mean, ways that you can access data. It's very general. So you ask for the data, and it comes back in got f of x. This is a standard sort of model. So you, 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 given database like, uh, data like this, you can probe for you know, the eye, the hat, or what have you. Ah, yes, but there's noise, OK? And so you don't have uh, this picture, actually. I mean, you, you think you do, but you don't. Uh, instead, you have this. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of noise. And so what do you do? Maybe your program can only handle you know, Playboy Centerfold playmates which is what she was, and uh, not primates. So, so I'm going to fix that for you, OK? So here's the idea. You have some class, so say humans. It could be bipartite graphs. But if you have a choice, do you want bipartite graphs or do you want this? So, so you have a class, <laughs> I call it humans, and your algorithm will only deal with humans, all right? Now, here's a, a point, an input that's not a human. Uh, you know, I have a different picture usually, but when I go south of the Mason-Dixon line, I don't show that picture of <laughs> of I the other of the other monkey. Yeah, no, and uh, <laughs> I give it. Yeah, no, okay. So, so the idea is you define a notion of distance. What is the closest human to this monkey? No, it, it's not in this. Audience, okay. don't do your work. And uh, now the problem is again that this, you're asking too much. You, usually, those problems actually are NP complete. There's an exponential number of candidates. It's very, very hard in any normal, you know, way of defining this uh, that is going to work. So again, you give yourself if the distance is epsilon to the closest one, then you say, well, what about big O of epsilon, which is you know maybe not the absolute closest, but something close enough. Now, so to say this is Homer. So what's going to happen now is that. OK, you had the centerfold before. And then now you have the monkey. And, and the monkeys are very nice. But um, now your filter will do the following. It will, when you have a request x, it will go and query the database. And then it, it, it might do it several times. And then it will finally input, uh, I mean, output g of x to you. And it will ensure that g is the access function of Homer. So it is the access function of the closest human or one of the closest humans to <coughs> the monkey. So that, that person over there the, on the computer uh, will get a human. But we'll get a human that's close to what the actual data was. And we'll get it online. The online nature is very important. Otherwise, think about it it's just a old regression algorithm. I mean, you know, you have a class of objects, something not in it, you want the closest. I mean, that's what regression is all about offline, you know. Yeah, and, uh, but here, what makes it very different is the fact that there's no undo and, and it's online. And the reason why it's, it, it makes everything so different is this concept you don't have in off offline regression, this concept of early decisions are crucial. Okay. I always give the examples that um, it's really a stupid example, but I have to inflict it on you, I suppose. You, you, when you're young, you worry a lot about your diet. You, pro, you need proteins, and you need all sorts of vitamins and, and calcium, and, and, and so on. If you're on death row, and you're given your last meal, 
probably you might worry about many things. Probably you should not worry about your diet. Say so like, whoa, but this is heavy cholesterol now. How <laughs> dare you? So again, it's because this late decision is not very important. But the early decisions are important. And for example, so we played with uh, you know, the, the group with which I, I work in geometry with uh, uh, databases of architectural buildings. And let's assume for simplicity that all angles are at 90 degrees. And, and now you access this building. And you say, give me this wall, give me that wall, give me, you know. And say you get the door. And the door is ajar. It's not at 90 degrees. Then what's the filter? The filter has to be just a little careful. The filter has to decide whether to change the door or not. Now, if the filter does not change the door, it will have to change the entire building because all angles will have to be 90 degrees. So the filter has to think, aha, uh -huh, no, 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 no. The door is going to have to change, not the rest. On the other hand, you cannot change everything. And this is, of course, such a simple case. It seems so trivial. But you can imagine situations where the filter just doesn't know. Should I change? Should not I change? And um, so we've looked at uh, problems, um, monotone functions. So you have a function that's in higher dimension that's monotone, except for some noise. And you probe it. You say, give me f of this point, f of that point, f of that point. And online, in polylog n time, you'll return something which will guarantee the function is monotone. There's no error. And it's not too different by, from the closest. I mean, there is a function that is the closest in terms of Hamming distance and uh, edit distance uh, that is monotone and is the closest to this one. Uh, so it can't quite get that particular function, but something close enough. Okay? We've done this with convex polygons. Okay? Uh, now, where things get uh, geometrically much more arduous. So, I was saying this is wide open problem. Well, here's a good example of that. Um, if you have a convex terrain, we can't even do convex polyhedra, just a, a graph, a terrain that's, so it's monotone, but you like to think of it as being convex, but it's not. And again, you can access, you know, x, y in the x, y plane, and then it'll give you the, the, out, the you know, the height. And the filter has to change values to make sure what it reports is convex. And we can show that we can, now the filter should be sublinear. It's very important because otherwise, if you allow superlinear, then you might as well just grab the entire database over, give it over to this guy in linear number of queries, and then do offline regression. So we don't want to do that. It has to be online. So it has to be sublinear. And the best we can do is, it is sublinear, indeed. <laughs> Not very much. It depends on epsilon, which is very strange, because this dependency on epsilon we can prove is necessary. Whereas in two dimension, it, it's not. Why is three dimensions so different from two dimensions? Well, I mean, all geometers know that it's very different. It's much more difficult. But it's, yeah, but it's very difficult because we're not very smart. Not, maybe it's not that more, more difficult. We have trouble visualizing things. But it, it is d different. There is an epsilon which you don't have in the other one. Certainly, uh, it could be, there could be an algorithm in n to the epsilon or even polylog. We don't know. That's completely wide open. So this is more like an existence proof that there exists a filter, but we don't know exactly what, what the best one might be. And we've worked on so this is more like ongoing work, and we have partial results, but it's really, uh, uh, I mean, a bit of this talk, I think, is to hopefully inspire some of you, especially students, young people, to, uh, who might be intrigued. Uh, there are lots of open problems, and it'd be wonderful if people want, you know, want to just go and grab any of these problems. They're all yours. I mean, it's, uh, and um, so we've looked at bi bipartite graph. You know, you're given a graph that's bipartite, but um, when well, you're not given to you, you can ask for edges. And um, so you want to fix it because it's, it, it, it may have triangles or it may have odd length cycles and uh, expanders. If you have a, that could be also very useful if you expect your graph to be kind of random and you start probing in it. Uh, I mean, you know, Google does that. Uh, Google, you know, when it does its search, at some point when it goes into bottlenecks, it adds random random links. But to some extent, that's exactly the philosophy of this. If you think you have an expander, 
and so you go randomly across the graph, and you realize that actually you, you're getting stuck in bottlenecks. Then you say, aha, the filter might say, aha, this time I want to change the graph. And you're given only so many changes, so you have to be careful the way you change the graph. But, yeah. So, so are, are you trying to, so, so you're trying to, just so I get the problem, so you're trying to reconstruct it with the fewest number of probes? Is, is, is that the question? Are you no. Trying to detect the fewest number no. Of probes? I'm not trying to reconstruct anything. It's a database. There's a client that simply c comes and says, give me this pawn, give me that pawn, give me this node, give me this, uh, this edge. And so I, I don't know what the client is going to do. The client might reconstruct everything. The client might just ask me for three edges. I don't know. Say you're surfing the web. The database is the web, and you're surfing. I don't know how long you're going to be surfing. I mean, I just, uh, but, the, but the thing is, if the property is that it's an expander, I will cheat. I will simply transform the web. Because when I see you surfing into little corners, bottlenecks, and I can see that this is not good, that you're getting yourself into a, then I will add random edges to make it more random. And I have to be careful. I cannot do this all the time, otherwise I give you a graph that has nothing to do with the input. So I try to do as little changes as possible, me the database, me the filter, and me the client, I don't have any idea what you want to do with it. You, you should be able to do whatever you want. So I, I don't understand what the statement of the problem is. Okay. W w what's the input, what's the output? Okay, so uh, it's a two-party thing. There's a database, yeah. there's data out there, and there's a client, okay, and there's a filter. Now, the client asks for data. The client says, I want to surf. This is the web. Right. I want to go from this link to that link. It tells the filter that. The filter looks at the web and says, OK, I'm happy with this request. And the filter gives exactly what it sees. But occasionally, the filter will cheat. The filter will say, yeah, you want this edge, but I, and that one, it does not exist, but I'm going to give it to you. Or I'm going to give you another one. And the reason the filter does that is the filter cheats in order to ensure the property. There's a property that has to be insured, say it's an expander. And if, if the filter sees that it's not, the filter protects the client. The client comes with the ID that this is an expander. And if the client is caught probing not an expander, the client will die. So the filter is there to protect the client. And the filter will make sure it only feeds edges from an expander to the client. Now, the ultimate cheater would ignore the web, would have an expander from the library, and would simply feed those edges. But then the error, the distance, would be completely violated because the filter wants to be as close to the actual data as possible. Yeah? Does that make sense? Good. Yeah? So it means that the best answer to any particular query depends on the history of previous queries. Exactly. It depends on the history and also the yeah, and what you think the future is going to be like. Because some decisions are irreversible. And once you decide to add this edge, you can never remove it. And therefore, uh, sometimes an edge can cause trouble. So, but yeah, it depends on the past and on what you think the future might be. I mean, we look at a worst case situation, though you could also look at, at sort of adversarial, we look at adversarial client, but, but you could also think of, you know, average um, distributional clients. But uh, did, did, did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. Um, OK, sublinear algorithms. So that now is to deal not with noise, not with low entropy, but with massive data sets. And so I've done a bit of work on um, this area in geometry. Like, I just mentioned one before I get to this. Um, if you have a convex polytope in three dimensions, then you want to compute a uh, shortest path, geodesic shortest path between two points. Can you do it in time sublinear in the size of the polytope with no preprocessing at all? So we said that if you allow small error, epsilon, arbitrary small error, which you usually have to because geodesics is you're, you're adding square roots. And so usually adding square roots is going to produce error anyway. Uh, then you can do it in sublinear time. And uh, But let me not talk about this. Let me talk about. Uh, minimum spanning tree, some work I did with uh, Ronit Rubenfeld and Luca Trevisan, um, where we envision this huge graph. This is a picture of of the web. I mean, some depiction of the web. Uh, think of a you know a graph, a non-directed graph, and there are costs on the edges. Think of the cost as being uh, between one and W. 
said they're integers between 1 and w. w is, is arbitrary, but, but they're integers, okay? And let's say the average degree, call it d. You can always call the average degree d. That's not a, an assumption. Uh, then this result is obvious once you see the algorithm, but at first it might come as a bit of a surprise that you can estimate the cost of the minimum spanning tree with an arbitrary small error, epsilon, in time that's proportional to d, w, and epsilon squared. In particular, on the web, all these numbers might well be constant. So, and the graph has no, the size of the graph does not appear. So the complexity of the algorithm is independent of the size of the graph. The, the graph could be a, a trillion edges, it, it doesn't matter. It's so independent. You're, you're outputting only the size of the minimum. Yeah. Very good point from that. Obviously, I'm not outputting a tree, because that would be, I'm just out outputting the size, yeah. And um, uh, so it's an algorithm that really shows the enormous power of sublinearity. You know, it's, uh, I mean, this is a constant refrain that um, when you try to, to prove lower bound and you can't, always remember that maybe the reason you cannot is not because you're, you're that smart enough, but maybe it's because algorithms are so powerful that maybe lower bounds simply don't exist out there. Maybe actually you can do much more than one thinks, okay? And uh, algorithms always surprise us by, they're always underestimated, okay? <coughs> Never the other way around, I think. So here's the algorithm, which is very simple. Uh, probably m many of you have seen in you know, algorithms 101 that when you compute a minimum spanning tree and the cost are integers, then you can reduce this uh, to instances uh, of counting connected components in a graph. So you have a, a graph with different components, and you want to count how many they are. So there are seven here. So you'd like to say seven. And so here's the way we'll do it. I'll pick a random node. I mean, a random node, yes. I flip a coin, and if it's heads, then I will start a bright first search. It's a very simple algorithm, OK? It's really an algorithm out of algorithms 101. OK, I flip a coin. If it's heads, I start a bright first search of constant size, maybe like two edges. I do it again. If I pass, if it's heads again, then I double the bright first search. So I start a breadth first search, but I step it, you know, I lock step, I, I, I stop at two, then I stop at four, then I stop at eight. So I go eight, but I go 16. And one day, it's going to be the other one. It's going to be uh, tail, tails, and uh, then I'll stop. Okay? And then I look. I look at n, the total number of edges, uh, of vertices, which I have to know. I uh, uh, look at the degree of that starting vertex. I look at the number of coin flips, minus one. I look at the number of edges visited. And I look at this number, chi, and here's what I will be able to say, that this chi is a great estimator of the number of kinetic components. I will simply look at this number and output this as my estimate. And then by using the obvious reduction from that to minimum spanning tree. So you end up with an, uh, an algorithm that's one page long. I mean. You can implement it in two hours. You know, it's extremely simple, and um, and it actually works. That's what's funny. So.